go to this, Diane is a fierce advocate for her students. No matter what area of law students are interested in or where they want to end up, she always makes time for her students. I recently met with an alum, literally Tuesday, um, and unprovoked, he said this, she is simply amazing. I couldn't agree more. She had taught me how to be a better advocate, a more client-centered attorney, to speak up when injustice requires it, to empower communities, not my own personal stature, and most important of all, she has given me the confidence to follow my dreams. In front of Diane's office, reads the sentence, everything is going to be okay. <laughs> and as long as she's around, I know it will be. Please join me in welcoming Diane.
over the years since then, she has become a very well um, utilized panelist and trainer on the connection between law and organizing, conducting trainings nationally and locally across the country. She has received many, many, many awards, and I will just highlight two. Um, the Rodney Paxton Award for Racial Justice from the ACLU of Florida, and the Miami Fellowship for Rising Civic Leaders from the Miami Commission. We are honored to invite her. We are honored that her is here with us. And please join me in the honor of welcoming her.
property lawyers that existed for the corporate lawyers that existed for many other types of lawyers did not exist for the justice lawyer. <coughs> and I think that that's really what brought me, um, that kind of brought me to sort of becoming a law professor at a, young, at a very young age, you know, just years, a heartbeat away from the students that I was working with. And really it was less of a teaching and, you know, it was less of a sort of teacher-student relationship and more of like a dialogue. We were in a dialogue and conversation together about how do we use these tools that we are, we are achieve, uh, gaining in law school to create justice. So I, I'll talk to you a little bit more about my personal story, but I also, before we go too far into, I, I kind of wanted to mark the current moment, because when I was entering law school, it was a different time than when you all are entering law school. Some things are, uh, are from when you all are entering the field. Some things are the same, and some things are, are particularly different, or maybe more intense. So I think emerging lawyers, like all of you committed to justice, are entering the time, uh, are entering the field in a time in which our children are literally dying from racism, transphobia, right? Let's bring into the room, we talk a lot about justice, but there are actual people that are, 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 are experiencing oppression and kind of the most brutal forms of repression in, in, our, in our country and society. So we think about Trayvon Martin, we think about Islam Nettles, we think about people that whose bodies have literally been, um, who have been sacrificed for those that are fearful of what they do not understand. Um, and if our, if our black and brown children aren't dying, they're suffering the daily indignities of being treated as criminals. Um, in, in New York, you know, um, we have this uh, Sapa Chris case at the CCR, we're litigating a, a sort of seminal police brutality or a police misconduct case around Sapa Chris called the Floyd versus the City of New York in which you know, the, the statistics are, are staggering. It is virtually a part of growing up in New York City to be frisked, stopped and frisked by the New York City police, right? So the daily indignity, what is the psychological impact of not being able to just travel freely in the city, right? That that experience is something that, when, when people go through that on a repeated basis, um, it only makes sense that our children don't know how to dream, right? It, 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 they're, they're not free to travel. They're, they're, constantly being targeted and racially profiled. You're entering a, a field in a world where transnational corporations are exploiting workers at all ends of the global supply chain, right? So you take you know, the recent factory fires in Bangladesh to sort of low-wage workers at Walmart who, who are who are making poverty wages or who don't have health care benefits to feed their families. Or the taxi drivers that I used to represent who are working 80 hours a week, um, oftentimes for, for little to no pay. You're also entering a field of law at a time in which government repression of dissent is at a high. So, you know, you take uh, Edward Snowden, you take Chelsea Manning, and being a whistleblower is no longer protected. We're entering, you're entering the field of law at a time where secret wars, drones, and surveillance are the norm. Guantanamo has been open for 12 years now. Uh, one of CCR's clients, Fahad, Fahad Ghazi, has been in prison at Guantanamo since he was 17 children that are sent to Guantanamo have yet to be free. And you're entering the field of law in a time where our earth is bruised and battered. Uh, we're seeing climate change, failing infrastructure, and I would say basically sheer incompetence swirling all together to create some of the worst man-made and natural disasters from Katrina to the earthquake in Haiti to tsunamis. Um, this is, a, you know, the, the sort of question of the earth is, is an ongoing challenge. So to summarize, before everybody gets too depressed, just to summarize, <laughs> we're entering the field of law at a time where people are still struggling to feed themselves, right? Where an honest day's work doesn't really yield an honest day's pay, um, and where our aspirations of basic human rights and dignity have not been realized. And at the same time, to me, just a, a, to, to, I mean, I think it's very important to be grounded in the actual moment. At the same time, while, while the need is increasing exponentially, you see the social justice infrastructure contracting, right? Because of the economic recession, we're finding uh, traditional civil rights organizations are contracting, we're finding legal services, public defenders' offices drowning even more uh, with limited resources trying to serve populations. And many lawyers are also kind of cynical, and you know, it's tough, it's tough out there to be a lawyer trying to, to push back on, on all these justice issues. And worst of all, um, and many of you who have been working in nonprofits before you became, you know, before you joined law school, is that we find ourselves oftentimes, you know, uh, puffing up what we do in our grant reports or giving each other self-congratulatory pats on the back, saying that, you know, we really, really solved something when we're actually not winning, at least not yet. Um, 
Um, so from navigating the courts to the media, right, to drafting legislation, to uh, representing individuals and organizations, sort of the task before you all, the next generation, is, is actually quite high. And in that sort of context, you know, I think uh, at the Center for Constitutional Rights, we thought, we, we think a lot about where, where is our world, where are we going? And it really, we, we decided that there had to be a better way to train people, to build a pipeline for people to be justice lawyers. And that's sort of what, that's sort of what spurred the creation of the Social Justice Institute at, at the Center for Constitutional Rights. If you don't know about, if you don't know much about CCR, CCR was founded in 1966 by attorneys um, that were representing the civil rights movement in the South. And since then, we've been committed to using uh, law as a creative tool for change. And I think one of CCR's sort of mantras or um, you know, a, a constant phrase that we use is, is the concept of success without victory. It is that at CCR, we're pretty much committed to taking the cases that nobody else will take, um, to taking cases in which uh, you know, it's really that the litigation is a tool, it's a process. Ends to, it, it isn't the ends itself, it's a, it's a means to an end. So about two years ago, we launched the Birth of Social Justice Institute. Um, and really, the goal there was to expand CCR's capacity to train the next generation, all of you. And what does that mean, right? So I think that for, for many of us, like I would say my personal story was that I had to cobble together to create a vision for what it meant to be a social justice lawyer. I think there's a lot of talk about public interest lawyering, but if you're really thinking about using the law in a radical way, but there really isn't a lot of roadmap. Right? There isn't a roadmap for that. And, and, and I think it gets even more complicated as you go further in your career. You know, uh, maybe your first two, one or two years, there actually are more people that want to engage you in that conversation. You get out four or five years, and people stop talking to you about it. And instead, you find yourself struggling with more complex questions of, of ethics, of what does it mean, what is a movement, which community, um, what does it mean, uh, how, you know, how do you effectively use tools like litigation to create change? And so with that in mind, we decided to create this institute, but our goal and our intention is to create um, a sort of range of resources and support for lawyers at different stages in their career, um, including everything from sort of internship programs, fellowships, um, you know, uh, trainings, uh, strategic conversations for, for lawyers around sort of pressing social justice um, and our sort of, uh, and the interesting thing about the Institute is the Institute is also part of a global dialogue. So I think for me, you know, the world was really small. I grew up in Miami, Florida. I have not traveled very far. Um, I had gone to see, you know, my home, my home country where my parents are from. I've been to India, but I really hadn't had the opportunity that many other people may have had to, to visit um, social movements in other parts of the world. One of the really uh, exciting things that we're trying to do with the Institute is actually open up a global dialogue. And so our, our institute is connected to 14 legal organizations across the world, in Haiti, in Palestine, in South Africa, um, in the Philippines, in Berlin, all starting, to, starting a global dialogue around what does it mean to be building our next generations, and what are the shared values that across context, across history, across um, you know, jurisdictions, and, and all sorts of other unique situations in different parts of the world, what is the, what is the common dialogue? So I'm hoping that that's something that over, the, over time, I'm hoping that we will be able to engage you in some of those conversations. But I guess in the, in the spirit of wanting to start some of that dialogue, I thought maybe it would be helpful to share kind of some 10 lessons that I learned along the way. Um, many of which are not sort of things that I imagine on my own, but are lessons that other people gave to me as well. Um, and I guess um, these are offerings. You know, I think that the sort of spirit in which I offer these to you is, is to offer just pieces of wisdom that I've picked up along the way. Um, you know, they, I'm sure all of you come in, I know that all of you come into the room with your own experiences and activism. Um, at, you know, now, either you are in the legal profession or you, you've been in law school for a while, so definitely hope that these resonate with you. But I guess the, the first one that I would start with is probably the most important one, which is stay the course, right? Uh, don't freak out. I think that it's really easy to get into law school and to experience what I experienced, which is a sort of jarring disconnect of what I went, right? I thought I was going to justice school, and I ended up going to rules and regulations to the professor school. And I think that when that happens, it's really easy to kind of, you know, want to run. And I, and I kind of did that, and I think looking back on it, I probably would do it a little bit differently now. But I really encourage you to 
stay the course, stay, stay in school, particularly. <laughs> Um, and particularly 
in a power-based theory of change, uh, you know, and this is what a lot of organizing, right, community organizing, which is now something that most people are familiar with. Um, how many, are there any community organizers in the room? Folks who have organized? Be proud, raise my pie. <laughs> okay, so yes, yeah, so I used to be a community organizer as well. And I think that in organizing, the idea is that you are, are you're creating a process in which those that are most impacted are able to be a part of transforming their lives. And that, that is, there's fundamentally two things that are important. Not just winning the external change, right? So fundamentally winning change in the world, improving conditions, right? Dealing with uh, racism. But it's not just winning the solution. It's also the process, how you get there. And I would say, you know, that's a, a very shorthand for what organizing is, but there's you do a whole training on what organizing is. But I think that, so I encourage you to develop your theory of social change. If you don't have one, that's okay. I think, though, now is the time to start thinking about that. And how? How are you going to figure that out? Well, it's study history. You talk to people that are steeped in the process of change. You, you become a student of change. Right? Because it's very, in law school, we're oftentimes taught this idea that change happens through legal victories, right? Which I know most of you probably don't agree with. And it's fundamentally just not true. It's just not how change has happened. Now, there's certainly a valuable role for lawyers in the process of change, but a lawyer-centric view of progress is one that's just historically inaccurate. And so I would encourage you to think about, spend the time, you know, supplementing your legal education with history. Um, with thinking about social movements, with talking with elders that have been a part of the civil rights, the civil rights movements or other movements uh, that you can get your you can get um, in contact with. And then finally, once you develop a sort of theory, right? Theories are not uh, hopefully they're not static. You're going to experiment with it, and maybe you'll get a chance to use it, and you'll refine. And it's a lifelong process. I don't. I think I can tell you that I broadly have a power-based theory of change, but what that means in every context is fairly unique and context specific. And so it's a process of developing a theory, experimenting with it, debriefing, and refining. So that would be sort of lesson number two. Um, lesson three is sort of goes connected to it, which is learning inside and outside of the classroom. Um, and this one I did very well. I did not like to be in the classroom. But I'd say first and foremost, and this is something that oftentimes when you get into your activist sort of mindset or around other activists, you forget to emphasize this, which is fundamentally being a justice lawyer means being a good lawyer. It means being a damn good lawyer. It means being a brilliant lawyer. Because oftentimes the resources that you have are far less than the resources elsewhere. Uh, the opposition is usually very, you know, the, the issues are controversial. Oftentimes you're pushing the edge of the law. And so fundamentally, spending time in law school Learning how to be a good lawyer is, is very important. Now, I, most of us that have been practicing for a while will tell you you really don't learn how to be a lawyer until you start practicing. But I do think that there are ways to really maximize your time. So work, you know, really thinking intentionally about your, your internships, really thinking intentionally about clinical um, education, having experiential learning while you're in law school. Because fundamentally, um, I think that our movements, uh, the variety of movements that are out there, need people that actually lawyer. Um, and I think it's not just litigation. It's easy to look at lawyering and say, okay, well, what I need to learn how to do is be a litigator. I think that if you are going to be an effective justice lawyer, I think you have to think expansively about what tools are in your tool belt. Uh, most of us that have done, when, when I was representing taxi drivers or representing tenant unions, sure, there was a fair amount of traditional litigation, but there was also everything from, from writing legislation to trying to figure out how to get it passed to media work, um, to other types of strategic communications work, to research and writing. Uh, ideally, I think if you want to be a movement-based lawyer, a community lawyer, a radical lawyer, right, there's lots of terms out there, people's lawyer, I think you have to view yourself as being a tool. So in the sense that you are trying to make yourself useful and you're trying to figure out what is it that needs to get done and I'm going to figure out how to do it. And that means that, yes, you'll be 30 years into your career and you'll be learning something new and you'll be starting from ground zero somewhere. And I think it's getting comfortable with that. And I think oftentimes the, the way the legal system is structured, um, it kind of creates, a, it channels us into doing what we know how to do, right? So we become further and further and further specialized. So not only am I, you know, a plaintiff side lawyer, but I'm a plaintiff side lawyer that does this very discreet and I think that that's sort of the way our profession is structured. It almost kind of um, makes it possible to just have a very narrow set of knowledge, which is complex, but narrow. And then you only take cases that kind of fit into that. And I would really
really encourage you, if you are interested in being connected to movements, you have to, you have to get comfortable with that, knowing how to do stuff. But use, use your time in law school to really, um, to really to try to expose yourself to as much as possible. I think along with legal skills, and this is something for more when you get out of law school, is to really think about mentorship. Again, something that we don't really talk very concretely about in law school, but I think lawyering is, lawyering is, is a craft. It is vocational. It is not sort of, you know, it is, a, it is an art in some ways, but it's a skill. And it's not something that any of us pop into law school and we know how to write the perfect brief or make the perfect argument. It's something that you learn with time and with mentorship. And so I would really encourage you when you're thinking about your first job out of law school, when you're thinking about how do I become a technically brilliant lawyer, that you really think about situating yourself somewhere with someone that can actually provide concrete mentorship, who's invested and has the time and the energy to be providing you with feedback and mentorship. Um, in terms of learning outside of the classroom, I would say, you know, we can get into these halls and we can kind of think that the, the knowledge that is most valuable is the knowledge that we learn in here. And I think fundamental to being a movement-based lawyer or a community lawyer is understanding, acknowledging, and really honoring the wisdom of everyday people, the wisdom that comes from our communities, the fact that people who live in difficult circumstances, people who are experiencing oppression, they know what that means. They know what they would like their life to be like. And too often times, oftentimes lawyers, we, we swoop in to situations with our knowledge, with our experience, with our you know, fancy degrees and our ability to research anything, and we make a lot of assumptions about what people need. And so I think the best way to start breaking yourself of that habit before it forms is to make sure that while you're in school, spending time learning outside of the classroom. And that means being a citizen of wherever you are. You know, there are issues going on. You may not be from Palo Alto, um, but there are things happening in East Palo Alto that as a citizen of this community, you should be aware of and you should be involved in. So spending time understanding the context of the places you live in is your first sort of practice um, at being, um, at learning how to hear the wisdom of the communities that we are interested in serving once we leave. I would say lesson four is internalize the limits of the law. Uh, it never ceases to amaze me, uh, as, a, as a lawyer, it never ceases to amaze me how much people really do believe in the power of the law to create justice. Seasoned organizers, people that have, have spent their careers or their lives really um, trying to break down the systems, still, when it comes down to sort of the possibility of a legal strategy, feel pretty positive about that. They feel very sure that if you could just get the story in front of the judge, if you could just tell them what happened here, that they would understand that this was wrong. And it takes, it, you know, that's what we call hegemonic thought. It takes a lot of time and energy to be constantly centered and grounded in this idea that you, this, there is certainly the possibility to create change through the law, but more often than not, the law does not understand or validate the kinds of harms that our communities are going through. They're not fundamentally illegal. They're not problematic. In fact, the system that we are all priests and priestesses of actually is designed most oftentimes to protect those interests, right? And that doesn't mean you can't use the law in a subversive way. Um, I, I fundamentally wholeheartedly believe that there's a way to, to be a part of the process of justice as a lawyer. But it also means to not be mistaken. Don't be mistaken about that. And it's very easy. The, more, the longer you do it, the, the, the more hours you've spent on a brief, the more years you've spent on a case, the more invested you can get, the more hopeful you find yourself being that, oh, yes, justice is going to come, justice is going to happen. And I think that this is why I throw my lot in with movements, is that the law alone has, to me, has never really been able to create sustainable change. And, you know, just today or yesterday, um, the Stop and Frisk case, which, in which we had a huge victory, which the judge ordered, um, you know, a bunch of remedial actions to take place and basically said that the New York City Police Department was, um, was had discriminatory policing conduct. You know, they, we now the Second Circuit basically took that case on appeal and um, unraveled some of that opinion, basically reassigned the case. And power is, power will find a way to shift and change. And so in that sense, I think it's really important to 
understand the limits of the law. I think you also have to really speak truth about the law. When you first start out as a, as a justice lawyer, when I first, I returned to my hometown, I returned to Miami, where I had a lot of relationships with my friends, my family, were community organizers. So I didn't, I wasn't your sort of typical lawyer that was, you know, in a community in which you really had to start off from ground zero, building trust. I had a lot of trust, but even then, you know, you sort of, you build your relationships over time. Um, you start to figure out how to work collaboratively with people. And I found that as time went on and more trust was developed, I found that people would oftentimes, would oftentimes not be able to have clarity around the role of the lawyer. People who I had known for a long time. So sometimes our role as lawyers is actually to remind people that originally your goals were X. And remember, we don't think that this tool is gonna get you where you wanna go. And you, in, in their field, you know, so it's very exciting for people to think that what you have to offer is actually gonna change something. And it takes a lot of uh, sort of self-awareness to be in a place where you can remind people and say, no, actually, I'm not sure that this is going to get you where you wanted to go. So I really, uh, you know, I think that part of internalizing the limits of the law is speaking truth about that, right? Not being afraid to remind people um, that the law has not always yielded the interests of justice. Um, uh, lesson five is to be authentic. Um, I think the first piece of being authentic is you got to own the privilege. Now that's a complicated statement, right? Not all of us come into law school with, with all the same privilege. In fact, uh, we probably come in with very different privilege. Uh, you know, some of us are working in communities that we came, we came up in. Some, of, you know, some people are working for low-wage workers and their parents are low-wage workers, or they were at some point. So I don't think, you know, I think one thing that's happening is the face of, boy, of lawyers is changing. And I think that makes a, co a conversation about privilege sometimes challenging or difficult. But what I would say, what I would offer to you is that regardless of what privileges you came into law school or didn't come into law school with, when you leave law school, you have lawyer privilege. And that's, that's just a fact. And that means that people think you know what you're talking about, when sometimes you don't. That means that people in power oftentimes want to talk to you over talk to somebody else. Uh, that means that we're gatekeepers. We have the ability to use that privilege in a way that builds the power of other people or that takes away the power of other people. And so I think it's really important that you, you cultivate a practice of owning your privilege. In a, the other part of, I think, authenticness is knowing your strengths and weaknesses um, and, and not being afraid to tackle your weaknesses. Uh, like I was saying before, I think that sometimes the way the structure of our profession works is we find ourselves in our and that's something very human about that, right? Who, who wants to not be good at something, right? It's like we, we gravitate towards the things we feel good at. If you feel like you're a good researcher and writer, maybe you'll do more brief work. If you feel like you're a good oral advocate, you're gonna gravitate maybe more towards trial work. I mean, there's a whole range of things in between there. But again, if you wanna see yourself as a tool, I think you've got to get over that. And I think I struggled with that a lot. For many, you know, for many women of color coming out of law school, we don't feel particularly good at many things. I remember walking into the profession feeling like I don't know how to do anything and I'm not going to be particularly good at anything and everybody else is probably going to be smarter than me. And the reality was, obviously that wasn't true, but I think that it took me conquering some of my fear, right? It took me having to say, you know what, like, I've got to know what my strengths are, I've got to know what my weaknesses are, and I've got to be very dil diligent about dealing with my weaknesses, right? You never want your limitations to be the limitations of your mind. I think that that's really important to you never want your fears, right? Sometimes people say, you'll fight, if you don't challenge that part of you that kind of tries to steer things into your sweet spot, um, you'll find yourself advising your clients that, oh, I don't think litigation is a good option because you're afraid to do the litigation. So I think it's really important to be thinking about making sure your limitations are not the limitations of, of your client. But I would say you want to avoid the temptation to make yourself either bigger than life or invisible. I think that there are many community lawyers that fall into these two traps. Uh, one, the bigger than life, we all know about. We talk about that often. You know, many client-centered sort of pedagogy of, of thinking about public interest lawyering. We talk extensively about the lawyer in the front, you know, the lawyer that is, takes up all the space, that never shuts up, you know, who says the meeting starts when they get there, right? That, that sort of oblivious lawyer, don't be that lawyer. But I think there's another type of lawyer that, another type of tendency that's problematic, and that's the tendency to be and I think it's a fine balance. I know fantastic lawyers 
who, who refuse to take leadership when the moment calls for leadership, right? I think the only way you can make a judgment call about when you need to be in the back and when you need to take leadership is if you're self-aware and you spend time being reflective. And so I think don't, you don't give in to the temptation to make yourself invisible. I think that I'm not suggesting, certainly not suggesting that lawyers need to be in the front all the time, but I am saying that there are times in which our leadership is important, where your leadership will be important, where it will be valuable, but there will be no one else that can take that moment of leadership and move, uh, you know, move the campaign forward or move the, the initiative forward. So you need to be thinking about, are you ready to step into that moment of leadership? So number six, we're getting, to the, we're, getting, we're getting close here. So number six is determine what values will guide your practice. So law school is all about logic and analytics. We, I don't remember ever talking about values in law school. I really don't. And I think that if you want to be a justice lawyer, you've got to decide what values you are going to, you are going to have your practice uh, be based on. And I, and I don't mean just, you know, sort of justice, equality. I mean more nitty-gritty values. I mean, like, I'm not going, I decided I was not going to be a tactic driven lawyer, right? So the way law school and the profession socializes us, I'm an impact lawyer. I'm a, I'm a direct services lawyer. I'm a policy person. To me, those are tactics. I don't want to be a tactic driven lawyer. I'm a strategy driven lawyer, which means that I want to understand what are we trying to accomplish in the world? What is it going to take to get there? And what can I offer to that process? Right? That is a strategy driven lawyer. So my value was I'm not going to be a tactic driven lawyer. I, another value that I had is that I'm not going to be a lawyer that creates dependency. There's a great quote from an article by Bill Quigley, which uh, if you haven't read this article, it's Reflections of Community Organizers, Reflections of Community Organizers, Lawyering for Empowerment of Community Organizations by a dear friend and mentor, Bill Quigley. And in it, he captures the direct quotes of many an organizer on um, their experiences working with lawyers. Here, here, I'm going to read you one quote. It says, Lawyers have killed off more groups by helping them than ever would have died if the lawyers had never showed up. In my 25 years of experience, I find that lawyers create dependency. The lawyers want to advocate for others and do not understand the goal of giving people a sense of their own power. Traditional lawyer advocacy creates dependency and not interdependency. With most lawyers, there is no leadership development of the group. And I think that this is really true, and that's because of what I was saying before, which is that oftentimes as lawyers, we work above the ground in terms of this idea of sort of the root causes of oppression and, um, you know, of discrimination or any other sort of ism. We work above the ground. We rarely are actually working at the, dealing with the root, which is oftentimes powerlessness. And so for me, I said, I'm not going to be a lawyer that creates dependency. What does that practically mean? That means you're constantly trying to make yourself irrelevant. Which is a really difficult place to be in because, like, it's, we're all human, we want to be relevant. But I think a good justice lawyer is one in which you're not necessary at some point. You've transferred knowledge. Your goal is to make, make what, your, what you know, the access and the privilege you have, your goal is to make that accessible to other people. And it's not simple, it's not an equation, it's not something where you just pour something, you know, it, it doesn't work like that, it's a process. Um, oftentimes, it, it is one that takes uh, many years if you're even working with a single client, um, in which you can start to have the client feel more empowered. But I think the reason why we do that, or the reason why I do that, is because my uh, trans to me, you know, the, the sort of the world, the picture that I painted of the world that we live in, change uh, is not going to come easily. And so, what's necessary is people being able to feel more comfortable taking on fights. Right? It's the small moments of transformation, uh, the small moments of empowerment that actually are going to get us to a place in which we, we can actually push back on some of the, the repressive uh, conditions that we're living in. Um, I would say, in, in alignment with that, I would say the next value is that I, that I would be a lawyer, or I was a lawyer, am a lawyer, that builds and shifts power. Right? I think there's only two. It's very simple. We can have a lot of discussion about what, what lawyers do. I really think there's only two things that justice lawyers can do. You can either build power or you can, uh, you can fight power. That's it. And by build power, I mean building, the expanding, increasing the power of uh, disenfranchised, marginalized people, directly impacted people, or fighting power. Pushing down on the existing power, whatever it is, corporations, the government, um, you know, individuals, wealthy individuals, whatever the entity is that is exerting power. I think those are, it's very simple. Those are the only two things that you can do. 
them is more complicated, but I think those are the only two things that, that we can do. So I guess setting an intention, and I mean very, very practically, sitting down and writing, what is the code of conduct that you would like to use to guide your legal practice? Um, I think that if you did that, and for those of us that have done something like that, I think you will find it being your compass as you go forward. Because things, the kinds of scenarios I'm presenting to you are pretty simple, but it gets very complicated very quickly. And I think having that compass will allow you to make um, better judgment calls. Okay, lesson number seven. Um, earn your reputation, uh, earn your respect. I think that in the, in the field of uh, lawyering period, and that this is still doesn't even just go for public interest lawyering, I would say that your reputation is your goal. It is gold, it is worth your, it's weight in gold. I think that too often people think that, and I, and I taught a lot of law students and found this to be a reoccurring theme, is that, well, I'm taking the clinic in which I'm working with low-income people, why, you know, why am I not getting an A in this class? And I think that that's, you know, there's this sort of entitlement that is there for many of us, which is that if we make the sacrifices that this profession demands, which it does, um, if we, you know, that, that somehow we should be automatically rewarded for that. And I think that that's part of the, the fallacy of sort of legal education. I think kind of, you know, we kind of go through this stress of law school, which builds in us this badge of courage that we've earned something at the end of it. And I think some of that is actually just sort of a false construct. Yes, law school is stressful, but so is, you know, working for, you know, minimum wage summer as well. I don't think that law school is more stressful than a lot of other things. Um, so what I would say is earn your reputation. I think that it's not so much, you know, we can have the perfect politics, I can wax poetically about just injustice, but what it comes down to is what you do. And what it comes down to is the consistency with which you do it. What it comes down to is doing what you say you're gonna do and doing it by when you said you would do it. I think those are really basic concepts, um, which if you can stick to those, will make your relationships, uh, your trust grow exponentially, not only with communities and clients, but obviously with your colleagues as well. So I would say earn that reputation. Really pay, pay attention to the professionalism of your practice. Um, and I think that I'm not gonna stand up here and tell you that it's, you know, some people say it's easy to be a justice lawyer, that it's not any harder. It is way harder to be a justice lawyer. It is way more difficult to choose to do things in which the process is important and not just the end result. It is way more difficult to be available in the evenings and on the weekends, and then when you get that midnight phone call from people that are, um, you know, that are protesting uh, something, and they're they're finding out that the the last standing building of public housing is about to be destroyed, and it's midnight, and you get out of bed and you run there because they need you by your by their side. That's not always easy to do, but I think if you find yourself um, consistently showing up and doing the difficult thing, you will find uh, that will be worth its weight in gold in terms of your work. I think the only counterbalance I would say to that is just because you do that, don't expect for people to make you a part of their community. Um, you know, some of us, we work in communities that we came from, and even then there's micro communities and there's all sorts of divisions, right? It's not so simple to say I'm from Miami and I worked in Miami and therefore I was working in the community that I was from, because I did not grow up in the public housing project. So I would just say, keep that balance of like showing up and being there, but not always expecting that you all of a sudden now your family or your friends. And you will have those moments where you're invited into people's homes as if you are family. But I think we should not always have that expectation. Um, I think sometimes, again, it's part of the sense of we don't get validation everywhere else. We want to feel like this is one of the few ways that we can get validation. I would sort of resolve yourself with that expectation. All right, last few ones before I, you guys get down to questions. Um, I stole this one. Uh, I stole this one from Jerry, uh, from Jerry Lopez um, at Red Law from two years ago. Um, and he said in his speech, which stuck with me, which I would like to share with you, which he said, do not love humanity more than flesh and blood humans. Do not love humanity more than flesh and blood humans. I think what this means is you've got to live the values, right? I'm in Doing movement-based work, whether you're a lawyer, whether you're an activist, it's not glamorous. There are difficult people, there are tensions, there are moments in which people are inefficient and you know they create obstacles and the tensions get high. And you know, I definitely have had clients that I had a really tough time working with. And 
I think that it's very easy to think that, oh, you know, I'm doing this work, I care about humanity, and we don't think about how we treat the people in front of us. Um, so I would say bring your full humanity to your interaction. So that means when you're in law school, thinking about how, how do you show up with your, with your colleagues? Here? How, how are, you, are you present? Do you look someone in the eye and say hello? When someone says, oh, something horrible happened to them, do you actually internalize that and feel that, right? I think if you're not feeling and you're not present, um, it's really going to make it difficult to be in the field of justice work. I think that if you can find a way to be in a place of sort of humanity, uh, uh, you know, not just in humanity, but actually loving flesh and blood humans. You gotta live your values. Um, number nine is transform your interior. Um, what do I mean by that? I think that it is, too often activists were focused very much on the external transformation, right? We look at the world, and we gave you this whole story of everything that's really messed up in our world, and we really want to focus on changing those things. And what happens is we don't actually spend any time and energy on transforming the interior. And why is that important? What I mean by interior is your interior, right? Many of us, why did I become a lawyer? I became a lawyer before because of my own experiences with trauma, with feeling powerless, right? It was my way of dealing with that was to say, you know what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna figure out how to be a lawyer. I'm gonna figure out how to put on the suit. I'm gonna figure out how to feel and deal with power. Well, that also means that I came to the practice of law from a place of powerlessness, from my own experiences and abuse with, uh, or trauma, not abuse, but like, trauma with feeling powerlessness, right? And so that means that if I don't work on feeling that, how does that impact the way that I show up? Perfect example, I did a lot of work representing tenants. For, uh, for those of you that have done work in a tenant bar, or the landlord bar, is not particularly in esteem, uh, at least in Florida, they're not an esteemed uh, bunch of people. There's a lot of posturing, a lot of puffing up, a lot of, you know, these cases go $80 for an eviction. You've got somebody who is oftentimes trying to intimidate you. And I found that in those scenarios, um, I was dealing with my own frustration, feeling, uh, feeling intimidated. And as a woman in a profession with a lot of men that were oftentimes using their physical stature to intimidate me, I found it to be kind of traumatizing at times. And I realized that part of that was that I had it done, I was in that, and I was caught up in my own emotions and my own experience, which is, you've got to, you've got to be, you've got to allow yourself to feel, right? The solution isn't to not feel anything. The solution is to understand what is happening, to have a set of coping mechanisms to deal with that, but also to be able to make decisions that are for the best of your client. In that moment, there was definitely, a, you know, a few times where I wanted to Miami and he wanted to come out. And uh, I had to really remember, like, what is my goal here? You know, I'm in front of this judge every week. Or, uh, you know, how is it going to make my client feel uh, if they see me get riled by what is very clearly the intimidation? So I think about transforming your interior. Um, and also making place for e emotion, right? It's like we're taught this fallacy in the law that there is no emotion in this. And it is hard. It is, it is emotional. It is emotional when you lose cases where you may, you know, where you thought that you could help someone and you can't. And you have to take moments to grieve and you have to take moments to celebrate. Um, so really thinking about transforming your interior. And fundamentally, I think in, in the last piece of transforming your interior is building the reflection practice, right? It's like, it's until you cultivate a sense of evaluating what you've done and truly being able to do that in a dispassionate sort of way, I think you won't necessarily be able to understand how, is, is what you're doing effective or not. And I think that focusing on sort of results, I think, is really important. A lot of nonprofit work can at times um, not be particularly invested in results. So I would encourage you to think about that. And the last one is to build a beloved community. I think if you look to your left and look to your right, you know, this will be your community. I have friends from law school that, you know, have been my friends for 10 years now. Um, who have been, when, when times are hard, um, fundamentally what we have at the end of the day is a community of people that hopefully love each other, that hopefully are in this struggle and fight together. I think that if you're not cultivating that for yourself, it doesn't have to be the people in this room, but it's, you've got to cultivate that and nurture it. I think we are shy or afraid of using the word love in the law, and I think that Love is fundamentally what motivates me. I used to think anger was what motivates me, but I found that when love motivates me, it's a much more sustainable place in which to be motivated. And so I really encourage you to think about building your community, building a community that's based on love and can support you and nurture you. 
And I think that's actually the key piece of longevity in this work. I think in the end, you know, there are ebbs and flows, and you win some fights and you lose others, and you're, there's another one around the corner. There really is oftentimes, you know, we're not going to sort of get, probably not in our lifetime, to get to the end of any of these fights. And so really cultivating um, the community that can help you go over these things. And so th those are my 10 lessons. And I would sort of add one at the end, which maybe throws the rest of them into a little bit of a question, which is, um, don't wait for someone to give you the lesson or the answers. <laughs> I'm over here telling you things that I've learned, but fundamentally, we're in this together. I really don't know much more than all of you know. And you are the next generation, and we need your insights. We need you to innovate in this field. We need you to be more creative than those of you, those of us that have come before you. The law is built on a concept of precedent, which in some ways creates stagnation. Uh, I think creativity is really important in the law. We are so, we're so used to looking behind us to what was done before that we don't really oftentimes have a culture of creativity in the law. And so I really encourage you to think about innovating, and not just in the sort of in your briefs and in your, in your actual legal, um, in your actual legal papers, but I mean innovate in the collaborativeness of the law, right? It innovate in how people work together to create, to execute legal strategies. Innovate in the types of institutions and organizations that can be executing justice work. You know, there, there. I tell you that all these institutions are contracting. We'll come up with new ones. Come up with new ways to resource and fund this work. Um, we need, I, I can't stress this enough, we need you to do that. All of us that have come a little bit before you, we need you to be a part of imagining the future. So I guess at the end of this talk, I would just sort of ask you guys to think about recommitting yourself to the purpose, the purpose that probably brought you to law school. Really think about that, all that purpose into, into the room. Um, and recommit to that purpose and thinking about kind of owning the role of being a defender of justice. I mean, I think justice is possible. Justice is certainly possible, but I think it requires working alongside social movements and organizers and, and directly impacting people. But I think if you're able to do that, and if you're invested in the small and large moments of transformation, if you're invested in changing the way you show up, not only with your clients, but also with yourselves, uh, with your colleagues that I think justice is possible. And, um, and I'm thrilled that justice is in your hands. So thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to talk to you guys today. I hope some of this um, is useful. And I think we have a little bit of time maybe to take some questions if people have any.
just, you know, I've had great mentors and really, I mean, they were my, they were my big fans and I had no idea that all I had to do was to just say, hey, I want to learn this. Can you talk to me? Um, I guess that this is a question that you already spoken to a little bit, but yeah. one of the things that I was, I was thinking about was, um, it can sometimes be very emotionally taxing to deal with uh, a client that you've been, you know, representing for a while, and then, you know, maybe it doesn't turn out the way that you envisioned. Yeah. You know, and I was wondering, like, how do you deal with that? You know, what I mean, on a personal level, should try to like detach myself a little bit from the situation, or you know, while still preserving that empathy that I believe is necessary really um, have an effect this social justice for it. Yeah. I mean, I think you're answering your question and, and asking it in some ways. I mean, I think that, I think most of all you have to be human about it, right? I think that when you suffer a loss, like, I think it's important to name that and talk to the client and the community about that, right? I think the worst thing to do is to pretend like something difficult didn't happen. I think at different times, and depending on the role you play, you might have to develop different I think when I was doing a high volume of cases in which, you know, everyone was being evicted, everyone had some life horrible situation, I think I did, I did learn to detach a little bit. I think it's important how and when you detach though. So I think, it, I, I think I was very intentional to not be detached with my client, right? To not be cold or sterile or to be um, self-focused, right? Really like I'm preserving my own sanity so I'm not going to be present as you tell me that you know, you're about to be evicted and you're, you're, you're undocumented and you're a victim of domestic violence. And no, I mean, I think you have to be present in that with them. I think the other piece is like having other, help, other outlets for your emotions, right? It's like there's a time and a place, but I think dealing, developing the interior. What is your, what is your quiet space in which you deal with emotion? What are your friends? What is your community that you can, you can vent and release some of that emotion? So I think it's, it's a scaffolding. Thank you. 
I feel conflicted about that because part of me wants to say that you know, I don't want you to armor yourself, but I think that's the reality of this profession. And I think that in some ways, when, when I've worked with a lot of other students, um, I, that's what I say, which is like part of it is like until the world changes, you've got to figure out the coping mechanism. But I would say, you know, like experiment, try one way. If that doesn't work for you, give yourself the freedom to try another way. And it doesn't answer it, but I'm just saying, like, I'm validating that that's true. And it's painful, but build community, build solidarity. Talk to those professors that get it, that will support you, that will give you, you know, that maybe help you imagine another way. And if you are really, if, it, if something is more serious, you know, I encourage you to also talk to people and say, you know, this is really messed up. This professor keeps, you know, calling out the, the social justice or anything. Um, it's sort of specific, but you're talking about growing power as part of the, part of the yes. social justice movement. <clears throat> Something I feel like is a dirty secret with the legal industry in general is how many social groups are forced to take money from corporate law firms, and it's just sort of that's the way the system works. They do pro bono work, isn't that great? And um, and there's nothing inherently wrong with working for a corporate firm. And there's nothing. But something bugs me about model. We just had to be speaking for a recently. Was from a public defender association, and she said, "They have this new amazing model. Great, great, great. Wonderful people work them." And she said, "You know, I hate DAs. I hate judges." Um, and yes, we get 50% of our funding from white law firms in New York, who are part of this system of oppression. I don't know. So I guess I'm wondering about strategies for sort of growing the financial support for the <coughs> independent of these sort of existing power structures for public interest work, and is that even a possibility, and what it look like? And I mean, I think that, you, you know, it, not, you're hitting the nail on the head of the nonprofit industrial complex. You know what I mean? Beyond just the fact that the money comes from a lot of corporations that maybe we are not aligned with, sort of whole structure of it is one in which, um, you know, oftentimes we're not, we're not results oriented. We get to wake up and do what we're doing and we get to kind of be on the tread, on the hamster wheel and then at the end of the day, you know, we got to write in a grant report. So I got a lot of problems with that. That being said, all of my career has been in nonprofits, right? So I think partially I'm a pragmatist. I'm like, until we have figured out an alternate way, I'm not a purist. I'm like, we need to be doing this work. Our communities are under siege and we need to that being said, I do think the challenge is particularly on your generation to imagine new ways of resourcing this work. The old ways, the old organizations, they are dying. They are dinosaurs. And so I think we have to think about an entrepreneurial. I missed something. <laughs> Yeah.